Welcome to this service of worship of Myersville Presbyterian Church and the First Presbyterian Church of Sterling, two Presbyterian churches in Long Hill, New Jersey, who are partnering together. I'm Reverend Stephanie Munsell, and I serve both of these wonderful churches. Together, we have a mission of the month, and in January, the mission of the month is the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program. It is the Emergency and Refugee Program of the Presbyterian Church USA. As we see violence in and around Palestine and Israel continuing, the PDA is providing humanitarian assistance through partners who are on the ground. PDA approves solidarity grants that will support our partners there who are providing humanitarian assistance. We ask that you support this important program and this mission of the month by making a donation to uplift these humanitarian interventions. Please make a donation and simply mark in your memo or on your check and on your envelope that this is to support PDA. Simply write PDA. We thank you for your generosity as we together put our mission funds to work, to do God's work in this world. This month, I'd like to call a few dates um, and times to your attention. On January 16th, the First Presbyterian Church of Sterling will have its session meeting. And on January 17th, we need everyone um, to have their annual reports into our office so that we can create our annual reports because on January 28th, the First Presbyterian Church will hold its congregational meeting in the building at Sterling. On January 24th at 6.30, Myersville Presbyterian Church will hold its session meeting. And then their annual reports are due on January 31st because on February 11th, Myersville Presbyterian Church will hold its congregational meeting. Please keep those dates in mind, and if you are a member, please come to your church's annual meeting. With that shared, I would like to invite you to put your focus in this time of worship to come before God as we worship together. Oh, 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 
Please join me in the responsive call to worship by reading the words on your screen. Here we are, Lord. You have seen us and known us from before the beginning. Here we are, Lord. Jesus, you have called us to this place. Here we are, Lord. Gracious Holy Spirit, inspire our hearts with courage and joy. Amen. Let us pray. Awesome God, you knew us before we were born. You love us into life. Open our hearts and our spirits today to hear your word for us. And upon hearing the word, may we be convinced of our call to ministry and mission through the church. Bless us with your presence and your powerful love, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, trusting in God's grace, let us lift up our prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you know us. You invite us to see ourselves through your loving eyes. We don't really believe that we have anything significant to offer the world. We aren't so bad, we think to ourselves, but nothing that special either. Yes, we donate funds for mission and the good works of the church, but we do not see ourselves as true partners in your world. Remind us of your love when we refuse to believe your claim on our lives. Open our eyes and spirits to see the gifts with which you have blessed us and to commit those gifts to serving you by serving others. There are so many things that we can do and everything starts with a prayer. So patient God, bear with us as we ask for your wisdom in our lives. Give us courage and strength to accomplish any task that you set before us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Beloved, remember, each and every day, is a new day, a new blessing from God. Each and every day is the possibility to start again. Each and every day is a reminder of God's extravagant love for you. Believe the good news that this is a new day of hope, of love, of peace. Amen. Join me in prayer as we prepare for God's word. Unstop our ears, O God, that we may hear your word proclaimed this day. Open our minds and hearts to be changed. Teach us, Lord, that we may follow you more faithfully. Our first reading is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 14. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it 
completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark for you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it is you who formed me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. Here ends the first reading. Our second lesson comes to us from the Gospel of John. John 1, 43 through 51. Listen for God's word to God's people. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? you will see greater than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here ends the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On Christmas morning this year, I got up at a reasonable time. My husband Rich and my son Crosby were still upstairs, sleeping. I made myself a cup of coffee. I turned on the Christmas lights and I sat down on the couch. We weren't going to have brunch until 11.30, so I was in no rush. It was a lovely, quiet moment. And I was thrilled to receive a text from my very best friend. Her name is Miko. She and I went to college together, gosh, almost 30 years ago. And then we ended up attending seminary, um, overlapping for two years. She's my son Crosby's godmother. Anyway, that lovely morning, I sent her a picture of my quiet moment and my wonderful scene. And she and I both laughed at how much had changed. Now, my dearest friend has never had children. Um, but she knew how many Christmas Eve nights after church services I had my pajamas on and I, sc I scrambled to get gifts wrapped and under the tree and stockings filled and how seven years I did that on my own with my Crosby and me and then for the last 10 years um, I shared that parenting uh, chaos with my husband Rich both my son Crosby and Rich's girls, when they woke up on Christmas morning, it was early and it was crazy and it was exhausting but worth it. Crosby's now 20. 
And I asked him if we had to get up early for him, and he was just very happy to say we'll get up for brunch. So much changed. I've changed so much over the many, many years that my best friend has known me. But some things don't change. That morning I sent uh, Mika a pi another picture, a picture of a gift under the tree. It was my gift to her. One of the things that hasn't changed is that I'm terrible about getting her gifts in the mail. And it's not unusual for me to see her in the summer and maybe have both her Christmas and her birthday gift for her. For years that was sort of embarrassing. And then it just became a joke between us. Mika knows me so very well. I don't have to filter or edit what I say. I don't worry that she'll judge me, even though she knows me so well and is so well aware of my flaws. It's a remarkable thing to be known and loved in such a way. Now, I hope that you have had at least one person in your life who knows you fully. Being known. It's a theme in both of the scripture readings today. Now, after Christmas, many of our scriptures that we read are examples of Jesus being recognized and named. We just met Jesus in the manger as a baby with great potential, but these scriptures remind us that Jesus didn't go into the world wearing a crown. The world had to discover him and get to know him. The first reading, usually in our standard calendar year of readings, is Jesus' baptism. Now, we missed that this year because there was a strange uh, happening in the calendar with Sunday the 4th of Advent, was also Christmas Eve, and so we, we didn't get to that scripture. The baptism of Jesus, it's very dramatic. First, John the Baptist is conflicted because he doesn't feel worthy to baptize Jesus. He recognizes Jesus as someone special sent by God. And John knows that Jesus is king, but not of the earthly realm. Jesus is the prince who rules by the will and ways of God. And he doesn't see how he could possibly baptize this prince of sent by God. When John finally comes around and baptizes his cousin in the waters of the Jordan, the voice of God responds and announces who Jesus is. This is my beloved with whom I am well pleased. There's a light show and even a dove. It's very dramatic. Today's reading is not extremely exciting. It's just a moment. Jesus has started his active work teaching about God, and he's traveling and he's telling people about God's kingdom and how we should live to be a part of this kingdom that is unfolding. And he is calling new learners, new disciples to follow him, to learn with him. And he decides to go to Galilee. And when he gets there, he runs across Philip and he says, come follow me. And Philip's response seems to be to run to his friend Nathaniel. Philip tells him, we found the one who Moses wrote about, the one the prophets preached about. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, you know, the guy from Nazareth. Now, Nathaniel's response is to kind of scrunch his nose at this and say, Jesus from Nazareth? You've got to be kidding. Does anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip just says, well, Come and see for yourself. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, that's a pretty harsh judgment um, thrown at Nazareth. It's similar to saying something like, does anything good come out of that backwater town? Nathaniel is skeptical about this Jesus. He's skeptical from the get-go. And in the book of John, this is the first time that someone who is asked to come and see Jesus hesitates. Nathaniel will struggle to come to know Jesus for who he is. Now Jesus, on the other side of this interaction, he has no trouble recognizing Nathaniel. 
From a distance, he sees him coming with Philip, and he knows who he is. He knows his name. He knows his character. He says, this is a truthful man, a, an example of a faithful follower of God in the tribe of Israel. Imagine how that must have felt for that moment to Nathaniel, to have this stranger see him and recognize him and know him. To have a stranger immediately relate to him like he's someone who he's known his whole life. This is astonishing to Nathaniel, who asks Jesus, how could you possibly know me? And then Jesus makes this vague reference to having seen Nathaniel under the fig tree. Now some Bible detectives think that this is a reference to someone who is waiting for the Messiah. Like it's sort of a symbolic reference. But generally, scholars just agree that this exchange simply shows us that Jesus knows something about Nathaniel that he just shouldn't, he couldn't. And Nathaniel is astounded. He feels seen, he feels recognized. He's known by God. The psalmist put it this way. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You searched out my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's so high that I can't attain it. It's one thing to have a friend, a sibling, a spouse, really know you and love you fully for who you are. That is a gift for certain. It frees you to trust because you know that at least there's one person that has your back. It gives you courage to stand tall in life when it's heavy because you know one person sees you as important. To be known like this is a gift that gives you permission to risk being vulnerable and in turn allows you to grow as a person, to be seen. But to experience being known by your very creator, to know that God sees you and loves you, as the psalmist puts it so well, it's too wonderful. It's so high, I can't even grasp it. To be seen and known by Christ, that shifts the doubt and the questioning that was in Nathaniel's mind and heart, and it persuades him. And only then, when he is recognized and sees, seen, does he exclaim, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. You are the Son of God, the King of Israel. There's no flash of light. There's no miracle healing. There's no booming voice from heaven. It's just one human being being seen and accepted and loved, recognized that God is before them, calling his name. Now, all the decorations are gone from my house for Christmas. I'm still working on the outside, but at least from the inside they are. Now, if you're somebody who leaves up your tree until Valentine's Day, you do you. But as we move out of Christmas into the new year, we all have to ask ourselves, did we meet Jesus this Christmas and recognize him? And if we say that we did, what difference does that make? How are we living as if we know the Son of God, the King of our lives? Friends, the good news for us is that God is not hidden away from us. In just a regular day, Jesus is before us, calling us. Come, my friend, I know you. I know who you are and what you need and what the world needs from you. Come and follow me, Jesus says. The journey is not done. Come, know yourself, and know me. Now, Jesus finds Nathaniel's ultimate recognition sort of ironic. He kind of says, did I have to prove myself just so that you would recognize me? 
But Jesus isn't angry at Nathanael's skepticism and questions. Jesus isn't dismissive or disrespectful. Part of faith is honestly struggling with the question, who is Jesus? And what does this mean for my life to know who he is? Jesus welcomes questions and questioners. He welcomed them, those who questioned and questioned, who came to him with an open and curious heart and mind. But there is something else lurking in Nathaniel's first response that I just want to stay with for a minute. I'm going to call his response to hearing about Nazareth a prejudice or a bias. He definitely feels a way about Nazareth, and it's not positive. Now we know that Nathaniel is a good man. Jesus says so himself. But still, there's this bias that he immediately jumps to conclusions when he hears about Nazareth. It could have, that slight little bias, could have kept him from the greatest encounter of his life. It would have kept him from knowing God and being known by God in Christ if he had simply dismissed seeing Jesus because of his bias against Nazareth. I can think of people that I've encountered in my life, and yes, on social media and in the public spaces, who think about life in such rigid and unretractable ways that they can't experience things in new ways. They can't rethink ideas that they have. And I don't mean just out there. I often think that if God were to come down in any old church, like our churches, and God would sit in the pew on a Sunday, and God could rise up and begin to tell us how to save the world and heal the planet and end war, that we would say, shh, sit down. Who invited you to speak? Are you a member? Do you have a theological degree? And we might even say, hmm, what's that accent I hear? Where are you from? There's a difference between healthy skepticism and hearts that are hardened by pride or ambivalence or prejudice. Now, once again, Nathaniel is a good man, and he has a friend who kind of sees his prejudice peek out, and he says, well, go and see for yourself what can come out of Nazareth. And this man, Nathaniel, is open enough to actually go and to see and to learn and to grow. He sees something different than what he expected. Now, on Monday, we will celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. He worked tirelessly to reform our country for good. He was fueled by his faith. And today I want to remind you that the civil rights movement was fought so that human beings with black and brown skin could be seen, could be fully seen as human. Restricting where they could live, where they could use a restroom, or go to what school, was, it was a commonly held understanding that these certain people were less than human and therefore they could be treated in this different way. The Civil Rights Act, which put an end to that, was 60 years ago, 1964. A law that said it's not okay to discriminate against these full human beings. Human beings wonderfully made, known and loved by God. We human beings struggle to really see each other and to see God in one another. If we can't accept and love one another, do we really expect that in our lives that we will be open to seeing God before us? I often hear some pushback, even from Christians, when we look at Martin Luther King Day and talk about teaching the youngest among us about slavery or our history of racial injustice, that we shouldn't be made to feel bad about our past. Prejudice and bias will only be a thing of the past if we do talk about it and don't forget it. We hear that message from Holocaust survivors who tell us to never forget, not to guilt us, but to have us learn. Why is it bad saying that we have made mistakes in the past, we feel bad about it, but we've learned from that? 
We celebrate MLK Day to remember the good people who stood up to injustice, to say our fellow brothers and sisters who are not of our color and background, my color and background, are fully children of God. If we are willing to open our hearts to God, trusting that God knows us fully, if we ground ourselves in knowing who we are and whose we are, we can open ourselves to God with all our flaws and work towards a better day. God meets us where we are. God loves us, invites us to be who God made us to be. Imagine being so loved that who we are is someone that we're comfortable with. If we know that God sees us and knows us, we can rejoice in who we are and we can be open to learning and growing. Friends, this is good news, that God sees us, knows us, and loves us, and calls us to be the fully loved people of God that we are intended to be. Let us rejoice that we are loved in such a way. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let God's people pray together. Join your hearts with mine. O Holy One, we thank you for your still, small voice, which has been heard by your people throughout the ages. We thank you that you continue to call to us to come and follow you. When you speak to us and call us, help us to respond. When you speak to us and call us, help us to listen for your guidance and direction in our lives. Help us to listen for the cries of your children who need a response from us. Help us to listen to the world around us and to insert our witness and efforts to make the world a better place for all of your children. Help us to listen 
to those places where there is inequality and injustice and corruption. Help us to work towards justice. Help us to listen to your still, small voice, prodding us to grow in ways which we most tend to resist. Help us to be a listening people so that our faith is not simply a baptism of our own worldly values and prejudices, but instead a people that our faith is grounded in your values. Help us to listen, O oh God. Give us courage to listen. We pray for your church. We pray that you would save us from our own divisiveness and our narrowness. Help us to embrace becoming your body in this world. May our divisions not prevent us from knowing oneness in Christ. And Lord, as we come to you in prayer, we lift up the prayer that your Son taught his disciples, and we too pray in the name of the one who taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Stars of night, I will make their darkness.
And now, sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ, go from this time of worship, knowing that the God who made you also sustains you. The God who calls you also goes with you. The God who loves you, loved you before you were born and loves you now as you are today, goes with you into tomorrow. Go with this love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.